God bless. I trust that each and every one of you are somewhere where it's warm and comfortable. We've been blessed with some beautiful snow. We're grateful for all of that. Uh, if our broadcast goes down, we'll uh, apologize. The electricity has been going off and on over the last uh, few minutes, and uh, our generator has kicked on from time to time. So uh, right now, we're thanking God for a beautiful snow. And if our power goes down, we'll uh, just uh, realize that I didn't cut you off. <laughs> I want to read a few verses of Scripture here today and share something with you from the Word of the Lord as we endeavor to stream live into your homes. I'm reading from Exodus 2 and 3, and I just want to read a little short bit of the story of uh, Moses, uh, where that his mother had uh, given birth to this promising child. The Bible said in verse 3 of chapter 2, it said when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river brink. I think each and every one of us probably know the rest of the story and all that unfolded in the life of Moses and how that the king's daughter came by and she was moved with compassion to adopt Moses. And uh, I'm sure, though, in light of all of that, that Jochebed, who was his mother, and his sister Miriam, uh, and also his father Jethro, I dare say that any of them would ever imagine that, uh, that Moses would be the prince of Egypt. It was something that probably never entered their mind. But there is a key phrase in the verse of Scripture I want to share with you, uh, where the Bible tells us that when Moses' mother saw him and he came into the world, it said she saw that he was a goodly child. And it said because of that, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, then that's when she built the little ark of bulrushes. The Bible does not in any way tell us that the Lord gave to Moses' mother the instructions to build an ark like he did to Noah, even though it was a small ark. It was a small craft compared, of course, to the great ark uh, that Noah built. But uh, the scripture tells us this mother put this basket together and placed her goodly child in that basket. I was looking at the word there, goodly, and uh, referencing its meanings when I came to the understanding that it also means a fruitful or a promising child. When she saw that he was a promising child, she built that ark of bulrushes, placed him in it, and sent him there into the streams of the river. And there, by the grace of God, the king's daughter picked him up and adopted him. <clears throat> I'd like to have share with you this thought this afternoon, simply entitled, When God Finishes What We Have Started. It seems that as I read the scriptures, I find instances there where God seems to, pardon the expression, hijack the efforts of a man or a woman who have good intentions and good motives, but somehow are not able to complete the mission that they have uh, set about to accomplish. I think of the uh, words of the Lord when it came to Joseph and Mary. I believe Joseph and Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus, was a young lady just like any other young lady, and Joseph, like any other young man, fell in love with this young lady. And between their families, an engagement was arranged, and they were to be married. And the scripture tells us, without a doubt, that uh, they were there committed to one another, and according to Jewish law, uh, the engagement would last for a year or so. And there were posted outside the doors the promises of that engagement of each home. As they entered into that home, they knew that that young man, Joseph, was engaged to marry a young lady by the name of Mary. They were going according to the laws and the statutes of that day and to do everything to comply and make everything as it should be. But, of course, as you well know, God had other plans for Mary. And the scripture tells us that the Lord spoke one night and saying to Joseph, Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. These are the thoughts I want to share, and it simply is along this line, that when we're living in such a way that God can step in and, and hijack seemingly what are our plans and our hopes, and he turns it into a major kingdom conquest, 
it becomes something greater than the than what we started out believing that it was that the purpose was. When I think about Miriam or Miriam, Moses' sister, I'm sure that had she responded differently to Pharaoh's daughter when she found that young Hebrew in the water, and if she would have said, Oh, that's my brother, and I intend to keep him. I intend to take custody of him. I don't want to release him into your custody. I'm sure there would possibly have been an aborted plan there at that particular point. But these people were working and uh, walking in faith with their best spiritual intuition to do what was right. And it seems as though God is attracted to such people who are walking in faith and attempting to accomplish, accomplish something and doing the right things, and God falls in along beside of them and begins to walk with them and open up doors that they couldn't open and make things happen that in no way they could make them happen. I imagine it was a total surprise to Mary also when the Bible tells us the angel spoke to her and said, Mary, you're the one that has been selected to bring forth the Christ child, and that which is inside of you is of the Holy Ghost. It is of the Holy Ghost. There's an attitude that I believe that men and women that walk with God have, and that is when their best laid plans are made, they still somehow <clears throat> live with an attitude that says, you know, this may not turn out the way that I thought it would, but I'm not going to let that be the thing that decides whether or not I'm going to live for God or be faithful to him. I believe that if you would have questioned Moses' mother, she would have told you, I don't really know how this is going to all wind up. I'm going to do the best I can with the best that I have. And I'm just trusting that it's all going to be okay. But if it doesn't, I'm still going to live for God. I'm still going to dedicate my life to the Lord. I believe Joseph and Mary were of that same mindset. It seems it's these kind of people that God by his own volition, decides that he's going to fall in step with and bless their lives and bring about a greater ending and a greater purpose than probably they believed in the beginning of what they were attempting to do. I think of those Hebrew children in Daniel chapter 3 and 17 when they were challenged uh, whether or not they would worship the one true and living God or the golden image that the king had set up. Notice what they told the king. They said, our God is able to deliver us, and we know that he will deliver us. And the God that we serve is able to deliver us even from the burning fiery furnace in Daniel 3 and 17. And he will, they said, deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But notice what they said in verse 18. But if not, if things don't go the way that we plan, we want you to know, king, that we're not going to serve your God. We're going to continue to serve the one true and living God. To me, they were saying what would really like to believe, would really like to believe that God is going to step in, and before we ever face that fiery furnace, God is going to deliver us. However, if things don't go the way we hope, we are still going to stay true to our convictions and our beliefs. It's just a feeling of mine that God is attracted to people with that kind of an attitude. Just like I said a while ago, the mother of Moses did the very best that she could. But honestly, she did not know that the king's daughter was going to walk out that day and rescue her son and make him the prince of Egypt. No, I believe she was doing the best that she could. And she said, I'm just going to take a step here of faith. I'm going to do my best to preserve my son and irregardless of how this turns out, I'm not going to blame God. If things don't go the way that I think they should, I'm not going to walk out on God. I'm going to be true and faithful to Him. That's the thing that I believe that God is attracted to in people like this. I've known people in my lifetime who have quit living for God because a project that they endeavored to accomplish or something they started out to do, uh, for the right purpose, but yet it seemed that it did not succeed. It never came to the expected end that they wanted, and so they got disappointed, and they basically said, you know, it looks like God failed me, so why should I live for him? The fact is, God knows the end from the beginning, and he knows the true intent of our hearts. 
And I believe that when our heart has the right intent that says, you know, I'm endeavoring to get something accomplished here for the glory of God. If it turns out good, well, glory be to God. I give him the praise and I'm going to live for him. If it doesn't turn out okay, I'm still going to live for God. I believe that's when God steps into the lives of people, amen, and helps them and assists them to a greater end. God will finish what we start when we decide beforehand that we're not going to quit living for him regardless of the consequences. That is why I believe in my heart today that he will finish what we started when we have made up in our hearts and minds that irregardless of how this turns out, I'm still going to be living for God. I guess that's what gives me the feeling uh, about Samson with all the bad decisions that he made, with all the mistakes that he made. His name is written down in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, that chapter of faith, listed right along with Abraham and all the rest, because I believe there was one thing that Samson had. Even though he made some bad decisions, he dated a Philistine woman, he tied foxes' tails together, sent them through the fields of the Philistines and caused them to rise up against God's people. Yes, he did make some poor decisions. But I will say this, every time Samson started something, God gave him the anointing to finish it. He gave him the anointing to finish it. God finished what Samson started. But I want you to know this, I noticed in reading about Samson. It's never recorded that Samson ever worshipped another god. It's never recorded that Samson ever worshipped another god. He never changed his allegiance from the one true and living God to a Philistine god. He may have mixed with the Philistines, but he never worshipped their god. He always was faithful to Jehovah God. That, my friend, in closing today is how I see the lives of two different men like Peter and also like Judas. You see, the key word there in the word that I read to you earlier about Noah, excuse me, about, about to Moses was simply this. And that was that he had a life that promised, a life that was promised. He was a goodly child. He was a life that seemingly testified of promise. I would say to each and every one of you today, God help each and every one of us to live a life that seemingly evokes a sense of promise. How do I do that, Brother McGuire? Well, I'll tell you how. You make up your mind, irregardless as to how life is going to go, I am going to live for God. I am going to live for God. I remember some years ago when we were building our new building and it seemed like every door that I knocked on never opened up. No possibilities for financial relief anywhere, everywhere I looked. And I remember there were some times in prayer where I really wondered if we were going to make it or not. And then it would come down to me and that voice would speak to my heart. What are you going to do if God doesn't come through? What are you going to do if everything fails? And all of this falls down at your feet. I made up my mind, irregardless of what happens, I'm going to live for God. Amen. Praise God. You've got to make up your mind that you're going to live for God irregardless of what the challenge is, you're going to stay faithful to God. And when you do that, God is not ashamed to fall in step with you and to finish what you started. Sometimes it's not the best decision. Sometimes it's things that could have been done better. But if in the, your heart and in your mind you say, regardless of how this turns out, I'm going to live for God. Amen. Church, I tell you today, let's make up our minds like never before. Irregardless of how things unfold, I'm going to live for the Lord with all of my heart and with all of my mind. May God bless you today and keep your hand up on you. It was a joy to be with you today, and I trust that you're enjoying the snow and that all of your electricity stays on. God bless you. It's great to be with you. Look forward to seeing you again this week in the house of the Lord. Amen.